Hey, welcome to In the Spread. I'm Captain Chad Bryson, and today we're going to talk about a species that a lot of us sometimes fish for, but not a lot of people talk about. And it's a species that's available to a lot of people more readily than trout or other cold water species, and that's river bass. For me, it would be shoal bass here in Atlanta. Uh, shoal bass are indigenous bass to the Chattahoochee River system. And then my second favorite, which would be smallmouth bass, which are indigenous to all the tributaries of the Tennessee River system. So they're great game fish. They eat flies. They eat lures. And what you'll find is that it's really not too hard to go and target those fish somewhere close to you, whereas a lot of us think about having to travel a long distance to go trout fishing with flies or lures or whatever. Bass are pretty close. They're usually close by and not too far away. So we're going to cover that stuff for you uh, from flies, fly lines, different, different products in that category, as well as the conventional side of it. Because when I go do a guide trip, we're taking all of it. We're not just taking flies. We're taking flies. We're taking spinning rods. We're taking bait casters. We take everything that we need because it's a different dynamic. And some days those fish want to eat flies and some days they don't. Some days they only want to eat conventional gear, soft plastic, spinner baits, that sort of thing. So we're going to cover all of it, and I'm really going to try and simplify everything for you so that you can see that it's not really going to be that difficult to go out, hit your local river in a canoe, a john boat, whatever the case may be, and make it easy for you to get on some fish and have a good time. So I'm going to get started with the flies and lures that I use and I'm going to combine it and show you exactly what lines I use and how I rig stuff. Um, one thing I think that's really important to try and explain to everybody is that the, one of the great things that I love about river bass and the ability to guide for them here in Atlanta and you know Tennessee, North Carolina, is that unlike trout, bass don't require gin clear water in order to fish. You can still fish bass very productively with topwater top water baits, lures, um, as well as flies, even in muddy water, as, you know, as well as you know, swim baits and spinner baits, that sort of thing. So it's a really good time. I want to break that down for you, and I'm going to start with flies first. So essentially, to go river bassing, you need a six or a seven weight fly rod. I think a seven weight is probably the best choice. It fights the wind a little better, it turns over a bigger fly, and it's a little more versatile. Plus, the big thing about river bass is that despite the fact that some of them are only going to be a pound or less, you still have to fish for them just like you would a big bass in a big lake or a big river anywhere, because it's bass. They still eat the same stuff. They still eat big meals and they still want to see that big meal presentation because that's what turns them on. That's what gets them going. So everybody's favorite, obviously, is the topwater fly. But I want to show you some things first before we get to that that I use that are really productive, that make a difference, and really seem to work well. One of them is Bar's Meat Whistle. It's just a just a marabou rabbit rabbit tail fly tied on a jig hook. Jig fishing is a really big thing with bass. We always have used jigs in, in some form to catch bass in lakes, ponds, or whatever. The same principles apply with, with jig fishing with flies with bass. And that's something that's come around just you know here as of late in the last decade or so that everybody wants to do that sort of thing and it's really productive. Another one is the worm slider. This one, basically, it, it, it's exactly what I just said. It's a worm slider. It's a, it's a chenille tail, long worm tail with a little, little bead at the front and a little bit of a weed guard. Kind of looks like a worm rigged up on the back of a jig that you would pitch into stumps or whatever. This is going to go into the wood, go into the structure, be weedless, and get your fish for you. And so, as warm water fly fishing and fly fishing for bass and river bass has really become popular, it's been a really, really good category in the fly tying industry with a lot of innovation because you know what? There's, there's only so many different ways you can tie a Royal Wolf dry fly. 
right? I mean, it's a royal wolf, and it's got this, 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 and this, and that's it. You know, nymphs are the same way. It's insect-specific, but with bass, you really get the ability to become creative, use some different combos of materials and hooks and everything. This is an example of a jig fly, and it's basically tied on a jig hook, just like you would use in any typical conventional gear bass fishing situation, but it's a fly with dumbbell eyes, upturned hook, a little bit of a weed guard there, lots of flash, rubber legs, and a trailer tail. It really gets them in the river. And then my favorite subsurface jig fly, honestly, is this Jesus lizard. And what this fly does, it's got really big, heavy dumbbell eyes. So you're going to want to throw this on a seven weight or more. Um, but the great thing about this is the tail. The tail is completely articulated, doesn't have a hook. It's just got a hook here on the main body with a jig hook and a little bit of marabou. But the tail is woven, it's a woven fiber, and it moves around like so in the water, and they love it. And it's a really good time. You can pitch it back up in the back up in the wood, back up in the structure. It sinks fast, goes straight down, stands up, keeps the hook point away from everything. Works awesome. I love it. Um, if I'm not in the mood to throw any, oh, wait a minute, I'm going to back up. What I use, the fly line I use for these jig flies, believe it or not, most of the time the fly line I use is a floating line because you want that jigging action. I like this smallmouth line very much. It works in the Chattahoochee down in what we call the lower river here below Morgan Falls in Atlanta. It's warm water down there. This has got a great head taper on it. Turns over these bigger flies. And so the floating smallmouth line from Rio seems to really work great. And what I, what I like about the floating line with jig flies is that you, you want the jigging motion. So you want the floating fly line up here on the surface of the water while your jig fly is down here. That way when you strip it, it pulls your jig fly up and then it sinks again. And you strip it and it pulls your fly up and it sinks. And so you're, you're continually getting that jigging motion. Whereas if you use a sinking tip line, the sink tip line is down here and then you pull your jig fly and it just goes straight along the bottom which can also be effective in deeper water, but for river bass, you want that floating line so that you can achieve that jigging action with your jig flies. So when I'm, when I'm gonna have to fish some minnow patterns or you know maybe the jig flies aren't working, maybe somebody is just tired of throwing the big heavy dumbbell eyes, so then I switch gears a little bit because, you know, bass eat other fish, just like big brown trout that you can see on our other brown trout videos that in the spread, bass eat other fish. And so this is kind of my thing. I like fish that eat other fish because fish that eat other fish grow big and they do what I want them to do, which is put up a fight, put on a show and make people happy, including myself. So when it's time to switch gears and I go to minnow patterns, and I, I'm, I'm gonna be brutally honest with you here, and I know the manufacturers would love to hear me say, oh, this is the only one that works. Yeah, that's not the case. A minnow pattern is a minnow pattern is a minnow pattern. And as long as it's got some flash and it looks right, and most importantly has some sort of eyes, eyeballs on it, because you know bait fish have eyes, so it's important to look right, Anything that's a minnow pattern is going to catch a river bass because at the end of the day, it's not that they're that smart. They're just that hungry, and that's all they really want. So if you got some minnow-type flies, that's going to work really good. So when I'm throwing those minnow-type flies, I, I do it sometimes with the floating line, depending on how deep and fast the river is. If it's not that deep and not that fast, then I'm definitely going to use the floating line because... The minnow flies are going to sink to some degree on their own. These are unweighted, but they'll sink to some degree on their own, and you won't have to manipulate them in any way, like with a split shot or whatever. They'll sink a good bit on their own. So if it's not really deep and not really fast, then I'm going to use the floating line. However, where most of us are going to catch these fish, no matter if it's smallmouth or shoal bass, where we're going to catch these fish, it's going to be 
faster, not fast, but faster moving water, or you're at least going to have to pull your fly through some faster water. And so anybody that's ever fished floating lines and flies knows that when you're, when you're, when your woolly bugger or whatever it is that you're fishing that subsurface gets into fast water, the first thing it does is your fly raises up because that's what physics do. Because your fly lines up here, your fly raises up because it pulls it up. So I use a sinking line. And there's a couple of choices here. I've always used Rio from the, you know, as, as long as they've been around, I've used Rio lines. I like them. I'm going to have to say, Nobody that we talk about here as far as products, you know, no matter if it's a lure company, a fly company, a fly line company, conventional line, any of that, we don't take sponsorship money. This is 100% what I use and nobody's giving it away to me for free. So when I come to you and I say, you know what, yes, I like this and I use this, that means it's because I bought it with my own money, not because some company gave it to me and said, hey, why don't you promote this for us? It's not what we do here. If it's a good product, we promote it. If it's a bad product, we don't promote it. Simple as that. But the Rio sink and tip line is a great line for the bass. And then one that I've started using recently that I haven't used in the past um, is the Scientific Angler Sonar line. And it's got a little different makeup than the Rio line. I'm not going to say that it's better, but I am going to say that it's as good and it provides a little bit different action to your fly than what the Rio line does. So either of those sink tips would be a good call to do that. And so now, you know, with everybody's favorite, the last one is the top water flies. And, you know, probably the greatest surface fly ever for bass is this Dahlberg diver. It's Larry Dahlberg's fly. He created it, he tied it. He's guy's a genius. He did a good job. It's a great fly. I've caught, I don't even know how many shoal bass and smallmouth on one of these. They come in a lot of different colors, a lot of different varieties. I like the black just because black works in just about any water condition, water color condition. Um, catches a lot of fish, end of discussion, Dahlberg Diver. And then there's always a lot of deer hair renditions of it. And you can, you can see that there's a pattern going on here that's very similar. But this would just be like another color phase, another another color choice of a very similar fly pattern. Lots of different ones out there. But the top water bite, everybody likes it the best because it's visual, it's, you know, you see everything going on, it's interactive and the whole bit. It's a great time. Over the past few years, there's been a couple of things come along that's new. Um, using foam bodies. Foam body flies have been around for a long time. We've all used them, but and a few guys have come out with some stuff that's really cool. This is called the Stealth Bomber. And in looking at it, <clears throat> it's a pretty simple fly. There's nothing, there's nothing really too remarkable about it. It's some foam folded over with some chenille body and you know a little bit of synthetic tail material there. But the way the foam is folded and tied and the action that it creates as the water comes around it really gets fish and it's easy to cast. It floats really well. It's even, it's even got enough buoyancy that you can tie a little dropper off the back if you wanted to. Stealth Bomber's a good choice. And then the one that's been a real killer for smallmouth and shoal bass for me this summer is Todd's Wiggle Minnow. So everybody knows, I'm going to hope that most everybody watching this knows what a Rapala countdown or you know, rappel a bait would look like. And so what the wiggle minnow does is when you tie on with a floating line, you strip it, it dives underwater and it wiggles just like a rappel. You stop stripping and it floats back up. You strip it and it wiggles down, stop and it floats back up. So it's a really effective fly. I don't even know how many smallmouth and shoal bass we've caught on this this summer. It's been great. It's been my go-to fly. I love it. So doing that with a floating line is really good in the river, covering some of the shallow, fast-moving shoals because you get that wiggle without it diving too deep and getting hung up. However, in some of the deeper pools, you run the sinking line and you pull the wiggle minnow through, and then it becomes a diver or a countdown just like a rappel of bait would. 
diving down, wiggling through the water. Super effective and easy to cast. So hope that helps you simplify some of the stuff on the flies. Now I'm going to move into my conventional gear, what I would use with spinning rods, bait cast rods, and the like. Um, I think what you're going to see here, I hope you're not disappointed too much, but I think what you're going to see here is that I'm kind of a simpleton when it comes to this stuff, because at the end of the day, river bass, no matter if it's shoal bass or smallmouth, they just want to eat something that looks right. They want to eat something that looks like another fish, or they want to eat something that aggravates a snot out of them. And it's, it's not that difficult to do. Some of the key things that you have to do for those fish in order to get those fish is just be able to present to them and to get the really big ones of the species, no matter if it's smallmouth or shoalies, you gotta be able to throw your stuff all the way back up into the wood, into the timber, into the structure, and don't be afraid to lose it. I know nobody wants to hear that because it's expensive, because jigs are six bucks and spinner baits are 10 bucks and on and on and on. And I get it, and you either paddle in there, trolling motor in there, or row yourself in there to get your bait back and then go find another place to fish. But the cheapest, most effective, easiest way I've found to do this is with some soft plastics. And I'm gonna cover that in a second, but first I'm gonna cover the spinner bait. This one, I know. Nobody's gonna believe I'm holding one of these, but you know what, at the end of the day, in the fall of the year, you can take this guy and you can pitch it in the river, anywhere you go, and crush him. Absolutely crush him. I watched Rob Smith put on a clinic with one of these things last fall in the Chattahoochee River where he probably caught a hundred shoal bass while I sat there twiddling my thumbs with my fly rod trying to be pure and had to just watch him catch fish. It was fine. I learned a lot from that. So I bought one and I did it myself and you know what, it works. So a big spinner bait in chartreuse with lots of blades really works well. And I've fished it for smallmouth since then and all of the rivers that I guide on up in Tennessee, North Carolina, does the same thing. The end result is the same, and they can't help themselves. When it comes through the water, when it comes through the water, all the blades are out. It's making a lot of vibration. This is a bait that I would fish in some off-color water conditions because it puts out a lot of vibration. It gets to the fish's lateral line. They can key in on it, come and get it, and it's done. So it's a good choice. Uh, the other all-time favorite is a jig. Any jig, half-ounce jig will do. But what the jig has to do is it has to get down. So you got to be able, if you see the structure, you want to be able to cast, like I said, all the way into that structure so that the bait falls straight down right then, and then you start working it out. Just like we were talking about with the fly. You have to be able to work that right out of the structure and so you can see that this one stands straight up it's heavy and it's going to sink really fast and come straight down and then you want to be able to work that jig straight up just like this the whole way through and you know you say well why wouldn't you tip that with a you know some sort of a trailer well, you can if you want that's your choice you know the fish really don't seem to matter they don't seem to care um, you know, I'm a big fan of pulling it right out of the pack and putting it on there, using something that works right out of the package, and these seem to do it. But again, you want that to stand straight up so that when you're pulling it up, the hook and the skirt are kind of trailing back behind through the water like so, and then it drops down again. So you can really work that through your structure and get those fish. That way they don't have to come all the way out of their little happy home in order to eat what you're presenting to them. Make it easy on them to eat, and these guys will do it. So the other thing I've found that is like super cheap, super effective, easy to rig is soft plastics. And I'm ashamed to say that I counted up not too long ago. Somebody asked me, how many packs of Zoom Pearl White Super Flukes do you own? And I've got over 100, but that's how good they are. And... This is, this is a bait that's been around for a really long time, and I've caught river bass, and I've caught shoalies, I've caught smallmouth, I've caught largemouth, 
and I've caught huge brown trout on this bait the way I'm about to show you how to rig it up. And there's two ways that I rig it. One way is weighted and the other way is unweighted and it just depends on what the situation is that I'm trying to achieve. But I'll rig this bait and it's, you know, it, it's basically pretty lightweight, doesn't weigh much, kind of just looks like a minnow. And when you rig it up weightless and cast it, it's got that dead wounded minnow action that it that fish loves so much. And so a lot of people will take this bait and rig it traditional with a worm hook, you know, just a J worm hook coming straight around and through, which is fine because it still has a little flutter action. However, saw this one time, hmm, I don't know, year and a half, two years ago with Captain William Tony down in Homosassa where he took some DOA baits and did a similar thing. I was like, hmm, you know what? That's really good. So I'm going to take that. I'm going to take what I learned from him and I'm going to modify it and use it for what my fishing is here in Georgia and the South. So all I'm using, all I'm going to do, I'm going to use a Gamakatsu 2 octopus hook right there. And I'm going to take it. I'm going to come right from, from the bottom through the nose, straight up, like so. Okay, then I'm gonna take just a little bit of line. And I'm gonna tie a loop knot in the end of my octopus hook. It's gonna be a miracle if I can do it without putting glasses on. I'm going to do just a straight loop knot in the end of my octopus hook. Trim my tag end, and then here's what I get. When the bait comes through the water, it's a straight line from the mono or the fluorocarbon all the way down to the bait. And then when you twitch it and you fish it like a twitch bait, you get triple articulation. The loop knot gives you articulation through the eye of the hook, plus you get it back here. So you get a whole lot of action out of a really lightweight bait. And again, this is really cost effective with a whole lot of performance. And you know, yeah, I know you got this hook exposed out here in the front, but at the end of the day, you can pitch this back in the wood and if you get hung up and you gotta break it off, you know what? A pack of super flukes is five bucks and a pack of 25 hooks is $15. So you haven't lost a whole lot. And more importantly, you didn't screw up your fishing spot by going in there to get your bait back. But I honestly don't lose a whole lot of these in the structure because the hook point is always up when you cast it. And as it comes out, it's twitching and moving. And most of the time, the bait doesn't even get past the structure before a fish eats it. So it's really effective. So the other way that I would rig my soft plastics, if I wasn't going to do the nose hook, there's a lot of companies out there that make a lot of product that's similar to this. This is just what I have available to me here in Atlanta at my home fly shop, tackle shop here at the Fish Hawk. And owner makes a great product with this and it, it gives a little bit different action. But if I need something with a little bit of weight, if I'm trying to cover a little bit deeper water and get a bait down, I'll use this owner hook that's weighted. So this is a four aught hook that's got a little bit of lead on it there. And instead of hooking back here, this is gonna, this is kind of gonna thread up to a to a traditional worm or you know worm hook rig, but it's got a it's kind of like a corkscrew. You just screw the nose on there. with the opening here. Thread it right through the top. And then just cover the barb of the hook over just a little bit 
so that it becomes weedless. I don't know if you can see that or not, but it kind of becomes weedless. Rubbing my finger right over the top of it and it's not stabbing me. But then I'll also tie the loop knot in the eye here. And then what I get is I get a, I get a jerk bait out of the soft plastic because then I can cast it a little bit further. It sinks a little bit quicker. So if I got structure way over there that I can't get the boat all the way to, or I want to be able to cover a lot of water with that bait coming all the way back to the boat, I'm probably going to go to this. And what this will do is it's the action is not quite as heavy as what I would get out of the octopus hook rig, rig through the nose. The action is not quite as heavy. But what I will get is a lot of side-to-side -side action out of this bait while the bait's staying down. And in most cases, river bass, no matter if it's shoalies or smallies, they don't care. They just want to see some action. White is my go-to color. And it really seems to work. It's easy to fish. And again, really cost-effective so that you're not throwing $30 swim baits into the brush and losing them, which nobody likes. Uh, nobody likes that. So, like I told you, I mean, it's a pretty simple program with my conventional side, and I really don't need to go to anything more than that. You can, you can use Rapala, you know, jerk baits or what, all of that stuff works. There's a whole lot of bass fishing stuff out there that's gonna work and does work. And everybody kind of has their own little thing, but over the years, I've just kind of simplified mine down to a very minimal amount of things. And I can use these products that I've showed you today, right here, and get it done every time that I go out. So now I wanna to talk to you about the rods and reels that I use and how I line them and adjust the drags and all of that with, with fly and conventional gear. And one thing that I wanna mention is that you can spend as much money as you want to in this sport. I think everybody knows that. Myself included, I'm so guilty of it. You know, the more money it costs, the more I want it. But what I try and do is keep everything as conservative as I can that's still a very, that, you know, that's still a very useful tool in the game. Uh, sometimes it requires, you know, tarpon fishing. Absolutely. You're going to want a T-board Nautilus reel that's going to work to slow down a tarpon. For bass fishing, the great thing about it is that you don't always have to spend the most money. However, I will tell you that you do get what you pay for in longevity. And so I try and look at it from a standpoint of, okay, how much am I going to spend for the longevity of performance I'm going to get out of this product? For me as a guide, it's a little bit different because I look at it as, in, you know, how many seasons can I get out of this product? Whereas, a, you know, if I was just a casual angler, some of the stuff I own would probably last me the rest of my life or until I decided that I just wanted to upgrade because the new stuff's cool. So if you get in my boat right now to go catch river bass, I'm going to show you what you would find or something similar to it, what you're going to find in my boat. So starting out with fly gear, I mentioned before river bass, I like a seven weight rod. Seven weight is like, it's like a nice go between it's a little lighter than an eight or a nine weight. It performs just about as good in, in regards to turning over the bigger stuff that you need for river bass. The St. Croix Imperial is a nine foot seven weight. It's a great looking rod, but more importantly, it performs. And it's like 250 bucks. Got an unconditional lifetime warranty. It's a great rod. So you take a $250 St. Croix Imperial rod and you put a Lamson Guru reel on it for another 220, 230 bucks, plus a line at $75, and you got something that you can go fish with that's quality, that's gonna perform, and you're getting out for way less than a thousand dollars. And that's what this this time, I know I just said it, you're getting out for way less than a thousand dollars. But when you come into the fly shops and you start looking at stuff, you know. New fly rods now, the top end fly rods are $900,000 for just a rod. You look at a T-Bore reel or a Nautilus reel or Able or any of the top name brands that are, that are producing that quality product that you need for tarpon, GTs, all of that stuff. You don't get out of here for less than about $2,500, $3,000. 
So what we're talking about with river bass is more in the working man's realm. I know it's five, six hundred bucks for a fly outfit to go catch river bass, but it's something that you will, will work for you literally for the rest of your life. You won't have to upgrade this unless you just want to. So that's one of them that you'll find in my boat that's, that's like that. The other one that I really like is the Sage Bass 2 series. It's a shorter rod. It's a seven foot 11 rod. This is the smallmouth line or smallmouth rod. This rod it retails, I think, for like 600 bucks or something, but it actually comes with a floating line. So you buy the rod and you get the line that's matched up to it appropriately. There again, you get this rod, you can do a Reddington Behemoth reel. It's a seal drag reel. It's great, really good. $110, $120 for just the reel. So you're getting a really top end product, something that's gonna fish for you, something that's gonna work. It's going to last and do what you need it to do. So I get this question all the time because you see the tournament bass fishing guys on television, they're just ripping. They're ripping lips and they're flipping fish in the boat and they're, it, it's a whole other world than what we do. But I get the question all the time about how do you set the drag on a fly rod? How do you do it? How do you know what's right? How do you know what's not right? When is it too much? When is it too little? Basically, my rule of thumb, it's all done by feel. And so any good seal drag, you know, disc drag or seal drag reel that you get is going to have a drag knob on the back. And I honestly do it just by feel. That's the only way that I do it. And, you know, if you crank it down all the way, all the way tight, so that the reel won't hardly turn, you're going you're gonna to lose a lot of fish. You want the fish to be able to pull some line, pull a little bit of drag, just so you can keep it hooked. Using a nine foot, eight to a nine foot fly rod, so you got a lot of leverage on that fish up here, but you want that fish to be able to pull a little bit of line. So I wish I could say, you know what, I set this to exactly 8.26 pounds of drag, but I have no idea what it's set to. I literally just do it by feel. As long as it's not too easy to pull out, it's good. If it's too much, it's not good. Somewhere in between is great. Uh, and I wish I could be more specific on that, and I know that's probably not what you want to hear about how to set the drag on a fly reel, but that's how it is. That's how I do it. I want to mention something before I go any further because I've probably freaked a lot of you out talking about how much stuff costs. And Fishing is a, is, a, is a sport, it's a hobby, it's, a, it's an activity, what, whichever category you want to put it in, that, like I said before, you can spend as much as you want to or as little as you want to. And so what I try and look at is the best bang for the buck for performance and longevity. And so sometimes my perspective of what's a bargain or reasonable is coming from a fishing guide's perspective. And so one key point that I want to make is, you know what, you may not be willing to spend $600 on a fly combo, a, a, a fly rod reel line combo to go bass fishing with. That's fine. And no way am I saying that you have to spend that amount of money. Spend what you can afford. Get the very best that you can afford. Because fly fishing is a hard sport, it's a hard activity, whichever you want to call it. It's not easy. If it were easy, everybody would do it. And I will tell you from experience that the cheaper gear is harder to learn on. Not everybody can afford the expensive gear, but I will tell you honestly, it is easier to learn on because it does perform better. And it does everything much easier, much more suitable than the low-end gear. However, we're bass fishing, so we don't have to go all the way to the extreme unless you just want to. So I'm going to move into the conventional stuff. And again, I'm going to try and keep it as simple as we can. So, you know, if, you, if you've got 200 bucks to spend on a combo for a rod and reel, for bass fishing, I would split it in half. I'd spend 100 on a rod, 100 on a reel, you know, or, or something close to that. Um, St. Croix makes a great rod. I've mentioned that several times. 
Their spinning rods and their casting rods are great rods. These two I'm going to show you are 90 bucks retail. I know, that's a lot of money. You can certainly get rods that will do the job for half that money and, and even less than that again. However, it's easier to learn and easier you know, to use a little bit more. So these $90 St. Croix Triumphs that I'm going to show you are what you would find in my boat. Both of them are seven foot, medium heavy, which is like a 10 to 20 pound class rated rod. Um, just got a matte finish blank, nice and sanded. The big thing is you're saying, oh man, we're only trying to catch one to two pound river bass, you know, with the, with the odd four pound river bass. Why would I need a 20 pound rod? Because you're still throwing big jigs, big spinner baits, you know, big soft plastics, that sort of thing. And like I talked about before, you still got to use equipment and fish for these fish the same as you would fish for a big bass anywhere. It's big bass fishing because you never know if it's going to be a one pound bass or a five pound smallie that comes out from under that rock and eats your bait. So you got to be prepared for the biggest thing that you could possibly catch. Um, again, seven foot, medium heavy, 20 pound rated rod. It's the way to go. And so then I'm going to move into reels here, spinning reels and bait casting reels and the biggest difference with the pricing and both the reels I'm going to show you are in that $200 range, you can spend a lot less. And if you're going with a spinning reel, absolutely. Bass fishing with a spinning reel, you can spend 50 to 60 bucks and get a great quality reel that's going to last you a long time. Shimano Sedona retails for about $70. It's one of the greatest spinning reels made for less than 100 bucks. You can find those on my boat and a lot of people's boats anywhere you go. But the Shimano Stratic for 200 bucks is probably going to last you 20 years. And so there's not really much innovation and in design that changes in these reels throughout the course of time. I got guys coming, coming get in my boat to go fishing. They've got Shimano Stratics that are 30 years old that they got on the spinning rod. They've replaced their spinning rod four, five, and six times because they've broken it, worn it out, whatever it is. But their 30-year-old Stratic that's white still works. So you know what? That's hard to argue with. That's what I use. Um, in regards to bait casters, this is a Shimano Corrado. The Corrado's been around for a long time. This is the 70 series. It's a little bit smaller and compact. I don't have the 200 series to show you right now for the video, but the 200 is what I would use. But I want to talk about the bait casters and the difference in why a $200 bait caster is better than a $50 bait caster. A $50 bait caster to me is a really good paperweight. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's a really good paperweight, and here's why. Because what makes one that's 200 bucks perform better than a $50 one is the magnets on the outside that controls the speed of your spool so that you don't get all that horrible backlashes. Everybody that's thrown a bait caster has had a backlash. I've done it. Seth's done it. Everybody's done it. It's aggravating. It stops your fishing. Nobody likes it. So this is a category where I would say if you only had 200 bucks to spend on a bait cast rod and reel combo, spend as much money on a bait caster as you can and and skimp on the rod itself because the quality of the reel is going to make the difference in the pleasure of your day versus not. So you say, well, why would I use a bait caster over a spinning reel? Both of them retrieve line and retrieve baits. Yes, they do. However, the bait caster is going to retrieve at a higher ratio. So if you really want to burn a bait up, making it move fast through the water like a spinner bait, you'd want the bait caster because it's going to retrieve more line per one turn than a spinning reel will. So I know some of that may be tough to swallow, tough to take, but that's the truth and that's the way I use it. So that's going to wrap up our gear video and if you really want to see how we do it and how we catch fish, the techniques we use and all that, check out our other videos. They're really comprehensive, really detailed. None of us hide any secrets. I've been guiding a long time, almost 30 years. And 
most of the, the, of the guys or guides, captains, whatever that you see in our videos, they've been working a long time. They work at it professionally. And the, the biggest thing is that none of us keep any secrets. It's all out there. We put every bit of it out there. And so that way, no matter if you're a pro or a brand new guy, a neophyte to the, to the, to the fishing industry, there's something in, in the spread for you. And so we have a comprehensive offering to show you in all of our other videos how we do it, where we do it, everything about it. There's no detail left out. I don't keep any of the secrets for my brown trout fishing, for my musky fishing, any of that stuff. I don't keep any of those secrets from anybody. You can call me, email me, ask me anything, and I'll tell you. It's no big deal. It's fishing. It's just how I make a living. It's how everybody else that works it in the spread makes a living too. So, hope you've enjoyed it. And if you got any questions, you can always email me. Um, in the spread has all my contact information. Hope you enjoyed it. Have a good day. <laughs>